Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest, one of my favorite guests, guy who's uh, written at least 10 books, has an excellent website, truefreethinker.com. His name is Ken Ami. We've done conversations about God, uh, Crowley's influence on pop music. We did another one about God, some of these other ones were about, was it the uh, Nazism and communism? So we've done a lot, but on tonight's show, we're going to talk about a topic that I'm interested in and have been interested in. Ken has also followed uh, the West Memphis, West Memphis Three saga uh, with me for a long time, probably six or seven years now. It's been a while. But he is doing, he has done an analysis of something that's referenced by many people in this case, and it's known as the Ken Lanning Report. And it was a report that was written in 1992 by Kenneth Lanning, a supervisory special agent at the Behavioral Science Unit at the FBI, the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. And it's referenced in a, in a way, and Ken's going to talk more about that, about uh, allegations of ritual child abuse or Satanism. And but people reference it, uh, these two ex-FBI, one who was involved in the West Memphis Three case, his name is John Douglas. Uh, he has referenced the landing report and referenced landing as if as they know him. And another one is somebody who's also around on a podcast called Real Crime Profile. His name is Jim Clementi, also references the landing report. But uh, we're going to go in greater detail with that. And Ken, are you there? I am, William. Thank you for having me. A pleasure to talk to you again. Awesome. Uh, thanks for returning. I really appreciate it. And I've read through your uh, case on the landing report. But, uh, you know, for people who haven't heard any of our earlier topics or read your books or your website, can you tell a little bit about your background, please? Well, the thing I was going to mention is that I published a book just this week in order to coincide with this cast. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm surprising you. Okay, good. I'm surprised. So, yeah, this book is called The Necronomicon Job. Okay. All right. So this is Liber 2, and I'm calling it uh, Satanarium. And the book actually deals with a lot of the things we'll be discussing today, from different forms of Satanism to Satanic crime to you name it. A lot of the stuff we'll be discussing. So I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. <laughs> write a book. Yep. Wait. Well, um, why don't you? So you've. What other books have you written? <laughs> excuse me, written, you know, just to let the audience know. Oh, boy. I have not counted them lately, but I think I'm over 20 by now. Gotcha. And uh, everything from dealing with um, atheism to dealing with certain theological issues, such as uh, specific topics like uh, the Genesis 6 Nephilim issue, to cultural issues such as post-genderism and uh boy just so uh, many topics one thing i love about writing is it's therapeutic for me it helps me just get things out of my head in a way that's uh make, that forces me to make sense of all these crazy difficult issues as i type along i'm able to put things in order and that's why i love writing and publishing so much yeah, and I think the ones that we talked about, we did ones was pop atheist Bible expositors. The other one was right. Crowley's influence on pop culture, how an obscure right. occultist influences culture. We talked yes. about the one I was uh, referencing was the one about Nazism and communism. That was oh yes, like guys to poltergeist, the consideration right. of Richard Dawkins, and then we also talked about the apocryphal Jesus. Jesus. So we're on oh, yes. fifth or sixth to show, but the new book is called. The Necronomicon job, Libra One, Lucifer Shrug, Shrug. And, uh, I, yeah, well, no, that's yes, that's Libra One. I just published Libra okay. Two, Satanarium. Okay, I gotta go back. Right. Okay. Let's see. Libra one. That one is the. Uh, I mean, I just submitted it for publishing, so you probably won't see it anywhere for a couple of days. Gotcha. Okay, and um, so you've done, written a lot of books. You've had a website for some time now. That True Free Thinker. How how long has that been running for? 
Well, what I was doing early on online since 2009 is I was running various blogs on various different subjects. And then I decided, you know what, I'm spreading myself too thin. I'll just combine everything into one gigantic website. And that's True Free Thinker. Gotcha. So it's, it's, a, it's a grouping of all your different writings on so many different yes. subjects. But the one we're going to talk about tonight, you've titled, and it's an article that can be seen at truefreethinker.com. It's on FBI Ken agent Kenneth Lanning's Satanic Ritual Abuse Report. And uh, you have the same kind of intro about his background as well. Right. But uh, it was something that came up for me, this whole idea of satanic influenced crimes uh, when I was writing the book Abomination about the West Memphis Three is that a lot of the motivations of these satanic crimes was dismissed. And I, would, I want to play this uh, talk by... Uh, John Douglas. It's about 10 minutes long, but he kind of dismisses satanic influence on crime. Particularly, he references Richard Rodriguez or the uh, Night Stalker in California. And let me see if this goes through. If, if, if you hear this, let me know. This was John Douglas talking at a open thing for the West Memphis Three in 2007. So listen. Let me know if you can hear this. Good morning. Yes. We, in fact, okay. were contacted in, uh, in 1993. Two of my colleagues were contacted. We primarily provided uh, uh, advice relative to uh, neighborhood investigations, what types of questions they should be asked uh, when they went around the neighborhood knocking on doors. We then were contacted later during the trial, and Ken Lanning was contacted by one of the prosecutors. So there's the reference to Ken Lanning by John right. Douglas. About utilizing uh, Satanism as a, uh, as a defense. And Lanning, a good friend of mine and colleague, laughed at him and said, you better not use it. You better not use uh, Satanism as a defense the, the, uh, because the defense team is going to chew you up and spit you out. Just go with your forensic evidence. Just have you lead with your forensic evidence uh, for the solution of the crime. Well, as we know, there were no, no forensic evidence to, uh, to, uh, to go on. So they fell, fell back on Satanism as a motive in this, uh, in this case. In the early 1970s and 80s, we began to see at the FBI Academy uh, uh, police officers coming in from around the world. The media was playing up that there were 50,000 children abductions in the United States. One out of three children were being sexually assaulted. Um, and as a result of this type of, uh, of information, I went to the National Institute of Justice and I received uh, two grants to conduct research. First research was sexual homicide patterns and motives. And the second research was to conduct a uh, conduct a, a violent crime study on a crime classification manual, which, we, which we're now in the second, uh, second edition. The first edition, we addressed every possible homicide. We considered using Satanism as a possible, you know, as, as a possible category. But then we decided to go out and conduct interviews, like David Burke was the son of Sam, and Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, which we did, and, and hundreds of other cases. And the cops were kind of throwing around words like ritual in, in their cases. and. Um, and, and using it interchangeably with, with satanic, uh, satanic crimes. We did a close evaluation. We looked at these cases, Ken Lanning, I, and my, and my other colleagues. We didn't see one. We didn't, we didn't see one case. That the first publication was in 1992. This was just published, the second edition was just published uh, last year in September of uh, 2006. And those 50,000 kids that are being abducted in the United States, we worked through the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delin Delinquency Protection. There's about 100 every year that uh, that are, are abducted, true true abductions of, of children, strange types of uh, types of homicides. That's all we uh, that's all we see. All the other abductions are pretty much parental types types of abductions, and we usually recover those children. So being tasked with this, I, I was interested. Is this going to be the first case? I, I knew a little bit about it, not much about it. I didn't want to interview the subjects in, in the case that were convicted. I, I wanted to rely just facts, the information. I did get to interview some of the some of the announced suspects uh, in this particular case. And the crime classification manual was broken down into group cause, meaning is there multiple offenders involved in the case? Is sexual homicide? Is, is, that, is it a, uh, is a criminal enterprise, meaning that is there an angle where there's a financial connection uh, to, to the subject and the, and the children? And the fourth one is whether or not it's a personal cause homicide. Looked at all the different categories. They looked and reviewed the the information relative to the to the case, and pretty pretty clearly, it was pretty easy to me 
to define this case as a personal cause homicide. This is not a, a homicide either perpetrated by a stranger. The person responsible for this crime uh, knew these victims and knew these victims uh, relatively well. The question I'd ask myself is, if the motivation is, is murder, if the initial intent is murder, go ahead and kill. Why did the subject decide to tie up the, the victims after stripping them down naked? I believe your initial intent in, in my analysis was not to kill, but was to taunt and to punish, punish these individuals. I saw criminal sophistication at the crime scene. The tying of the, the wrist to the ankles. I searched cases all over the world. I couldn't come up with like, similar types of cases. When I saw the offender, we call him the onso, decide to get into the water and to secrete the clothing by pushing down the sticks, the sticks in the clothing, hiding the clothing, along with the three, the three victims. Using that kind of concerted effort, we're not looking at teenagers committing crimes like this. We're looking at somebody who, who's relatively criminally sophisticated. We're looking at somebody who has been violent in, in, in the past, who's violent now in, at the time this crime was perpetrated, and would also be, be violent in the, in the future. So I did this detailed analysis. It went to the inquisitor, investigative, uh, private investigators in, in, in Memphis. And what they said was, as Douglas is describing some people here that, that we ought to take a look at. And lo and behold, David Jacoby was never interviewed by law enforcement. He waited for the cops to come knocking on his door. Terry Hobbs was never interviewed by the police until we, we conducted interviews of, of uh, Terry Hobbs. And then by, and I interviewed him two times. And I had one interview where he was very, very credible because I didn't have any background information on him. But then five days later, when we get this more detailed information, specific information, I talked to a total liar on a Monday night. He's a total liar. The guy I'm talking to, to now is being, is being confronted with his lies. It's a totally different type of bird. The person responsible for this crime can look at you right in the eye, can look at a camera and say that, that I didn't do it because it's a psychopathic personality. There is no remorse. Anyone who perpetrates a crime like this and leaves the victims like this in this condition, he's only concerned about himself. You can put him on the polygraph, he'll pass the polygraph, particularly this 14, uh, 14 years later. So looking at this case to me, besides being a travesty of, of justice, this is not a satanic murder. There's no ritual. There's no ritualistic uh, uh, crime going on here. I talked to Mark Byers the other night. We, we talked with the families here. I told all the families. I said, Mark Byers' uh, son was not was not targeted. Uh, everyone thought he was targeted. In fact, even Mark Byers would be the, the person responsible for the, for the triple homicide. The, the, the child who was targeted was targeted by a predatory animal that, that was exposed the greatest and, and where the animal could get to that child. It, it's equal. There was no preferential victim at all. All three children would be, be attacked by predatory animals. Yes, we do have the killer. And, and again, the killer went and, and through this concerted effort because he lives nearby. He tried to delay his identification because he lived in a neighborhood. And, and he did his best to delay, to delay that by hiding the bicycles, secreting the clothing, and also hiding the victims in the, uh, in the bayou. So later on, if you have any more specific questions, I'll be glad to uh, address them. All right, so that was John Douglas at a defense prince press conference in 2000, November 2007. This is prior to the re release of the West Memphis Three in 2011. John Douglas referencing Ken Lanning twice, talking about their crime classification and their methodology, and that had just been re, uh, re-edited a year before he gave this talk. This is kind of a clever PR position by the defense because they gave this press conference in a in a uh, legal setting. It was within a courtroom. So I think that that kind of impresses upon the public that, you know, this was some kind of in-court statement, which it wasn't. Uh, they actually elected to have the West Memphis Three plead guilty again in 2011 and were released before any of their so-called new evidence was ever tried um, in a <clears throat> in a form, a legal form. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to play that and show that you know John Douglas was was talking about this um, this subject, this Ken Lanning subject. So, uh, <clears throat> what did you think about that, Ken? Well, I think at the outset, I would like to say that Kenneth Lanning worked for the FBI for what uh, just about two decades. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have to give credit where credit is due, right? Let's just start right there. It's not like we're saying. Oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, the issue is just what is he actually telling us? And that's what uh, I want to spend most of the time on is discerning exactly what he's telling us because it's quite easy 
to throw out a one-liner, hey, landing discredited uh, satanic crime or uh, mass satanic crime conspiracies. That's a one-liner. You could tweet that. It's easy. Right. But to actually dig into the report and understand what he's telling us, that's a whole other issue. And that's why we need to spend uh, an hour or more um, where that's what makes this difficult is you have a one-liner versus a whole bunch of complicated details to plow through. <laughs> right. And so what do you think the gist of Ken Lance, see I, what they're doing in my opinion, and you probably keyed into this as well, is that these people claim there are things within the Ken Lanning report that aren't there or the actual gist of the Ken Lanning report isn't what they're actually referencing. So what was the gist of the Ken Lanning report that was published in 1992? Well, let's walk through it. And so one thing he states in the report is do not become so uh, do, do not become such a zealot that you believe it all, nor such a cynic that you believe nothing. OK, so that's a good uh, bit of advice from Lanning to start with. Right. Don't go to either extreme. So that's good. Now, I found it very interesting and amusing that he writes. Some have blamed me for helping to create the hysteria that has led to these bizarre allegations. And then he says there's also people who um, put forth accusations by a few that I am a Satanist who has infiltrated the FBI to facilitate cover up. Right, okay. <laughs> so he's getting it from, from both sides, right? Right. So this has been going on for decades, right? This is 1992. Yeah. And so when it comes to the general topic of satanic crime, I think people fall into two opposite errors. One is concluding that if a crime was committed by someone who listens to heavy metal or wears black and a pentagram, it must therefore have been a satanic crime uh, so that it is specifically inspired or justified by Satanism or of whatever sort. And the other error is concluding that no Satanist ever commits specific uh, crimes specifically inspired and or justified by satanism of whatever sort you see so um i'm pointing out both extremes kind of like what lanning said uh, don't go overboard but then don't deny the whole thing all right so interestingly he wrote that in 92 which was right at the tail end or maybe in the midst of what in the USA came to be called the satanic panic, right? Right. And what, and what would has, you, how would you define satanic panic? Uh, it, it, it's basically the one extreme I just mentioned, which is, well, if you listen to heavy metal, wear black and wear a pentagram, then everything you do is satanic, right? It's, right. Um, and, and that's some of the context we'll get into in the landing report. So we've gone from satanic panic really to satanic denial. Okay. Um, Lanning specifies three groups, which one is a uh, youth subculture in which he says some rebellious teenagers will do whatever will most shock and outrage society in order to flaunt their rejection of adult norms. Then there's what he calls the dabblers, which are self-styled. And then the traditional or orthodox, the so-called true believers. So there's three categories that Lanning lays out for us. And I found that um, due to politicizing or activism by Satanists and social reformers of various sorts, they seek to separate a person's beliefs from the action which they take, right? Mm. I mean, unless that person is a Christian, in which case the media and pop culture besmirch God, the Bible, and Christianity. So let me give you an example of that. Let's imagine that a person from a Muslim country with a Muslim name, raised in a Muslim family, uh, who attends Muslim services, reads the Muslim holy book, and believes in the Muslim God, commits a terrorist crime, and claims that it's done in the name of Islam. Well, our media and our society and our government says that person's not a Muslim. Right. Or if they are, they certainly didn't do what they did in the name of Islam. Okay, then when we incarcerate them, guess what? The U.S. taxpayers pay for them to receive halal meals, Qurans, a, a rug to pray on, and five times of prayer per day, because apparently that's what non-Muslims do. Okay, so you see how <laughs> there's the, 
the pol political motivation. First, we're told they're not Muslim, and then we treat them as if they are Muslim, right? Right. Um, now, generally, when I tell people to search something online, I don't tell them to Google it because I don't see any reason to advertise for Google. <laughs> But Google does have a nice function that's called Google Alerts. And for a long time, I had an, a Google Alert for satanic crime. And what you'll find is that anyhow, Google Alert means anytime something is published about satanic crime on the web, you get an email notifying you with the URLs and all of that. And so what you find out very quickly is that if a story of a crime is not keyworded, is not described as being satanic, then you'll never know about it. Right. right. Unless that angle is somehow touched upon in the reporting, you'll never know about it. Interesting. Um, so even so, every week I would get something on satanic crime and uh, tons of it coming out of South Africa, by the way, uh, where um, it's probably more due to their heightened sense of spirituality where it's more um, familiar to them to accuse each other of Satanism, whether validly or not, unfortunately. But that, that was just a point that if this is not being reported as such, if these certain details of a crime are not being reported, you're just not going to find out about it, period. Right? Interesting, right? Gotcha. Okay. They actually have occult crimes units in South Africa. Due right. To the frequency of cold crimes there was a famous doctor his name was let me see if i can remember his name it was doctor he had a, like this he was uh, uh uh oh man yunker i think was his last name but he was actually like a satanic crime that's what that was his job and he's actually was really famous for doing it so just and Lan lanning actually notes in the report there are those who claim that one of the major reasons more of these cases have not been successfully prosecuted is that the satanic occult aspect has not been aggressively pursued. Interesting. All right. So now, if we are going to say something as simple as that Lanning discredited satanic um, crime or satanic ritual abuse, um, I got a one-liner for you right from Lanning. The yeah. idea that there are few secretive individuals in positions of power somewhere in the country regularly killing a few people as part of some satanic ritual or ceremony and getting away with it is certainly within the realm of possibility. Interesting. Wow. That's what the report says. Yeah, that's amazing. Because they deny that publicly, yeah. Right. So but that see, he has something like that stated. Right. So the issue is to get into the context of what he is telling us. So let me uh, give you a few examples of that. So here's an example of how he's contextualizing his report, right? Uh -huh. Parents may choose to believe simply because their children make the claims. Therapists may choose to believe simply because their professional assessment is that their patients believe the victimization and describe it so vividly. A social worker must have more real tangible evidence. The law enforcement officer deals with the criminal justice system. The levels of proof necessary are reasonable suspicion, probable cause, and beyond a reasonable doubt because the consequences, criminal investigation, search and seizure, arrest, incarceration, are so great. Okay, so that, that's starting to inform you as to what he's talking about. There's a level in which he's, de which he's dealing with what parents claim, what therapists claim, but keep in mind that the ultimate context is the FBI and it is law enforcement. And so the landing report is not so much about whether there is satanic crime or satanic ritual abuse. It is more about do we know enough about it that we can actually make a legal case against it? Right. right? So That's he what he acknowledges was, that he, there's not enough evidence to ascertain whether there's a, uh, you know, this many occult crimes. Would you agree with that? Well, the main context for him is, can we bring this to trial and present it before a jury, right? And so that's really, really, really what he is talking about. It's not just his general opinion. It's not just his general research. It's specifically about whether this can be handled in a legal setting. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Why, why he can say it's within the realm of possibility and, and then why it comes across as if he's denying the whole thing. That's his point. And then as, as we go on, you'll see how this becomes really clear. So for example, um, he refers to ritualized abuse of children as a definition may have been valuable for academics, sociologists, and therapists, but it creates potential problems for law enforcement. You see that? Interesting. So academics, sociologists, and therapists may be able to deal with this, but they're dealing with it in a very different way than for Lanning. Lanning and law from enforcement. the perspective of the FBI, which is the perspective of law enforcement. Okay, so then he also states the amount of ritual child abuse going on in this country depends on how you define the term. One documented example of what I might call ritual child abuse was the horror chronicled in the book A Death in White Bear Lake. The abuse in this case, however, had little to do with anyone's spiritual belief system. Right? So he you get the point. It's he's how, how is he pointing out that right, it, it, right. So you get another layer of attempting to derive a context is how are you defining the term, even if you're bothering to use it, then how are you defining it, right? right. And so he states. A satanic murder should be defined as one committed by two or more individuals who rationally plan a crime and whose primary motivation is to fulfill a prescribed satanic ritual calling for murder. By this definition, I have been unable to find even one documented satanic murder in the United States, although such murders may have and can occur. Right. They okay. appear, but see, they appear to him to be few in number, right? But he sets up, I mean, this is kind of like legal, as an attorney, you see these kind of strained definitions of meaning to right. ex extricate uh, individuals or, or understandings of what actually is happening. Like, it's not a bank robbery if one guy does it. It's got to be two, you know? Right. And so he goes on to say, in a crime with multiple subjects, each offender may have a different motivation for the same crime. Right. And then he states, some police officers may even feel that all crime is caused by evil. All evil is caused by Satan and therefore all crime is satanic crime. And so he says that uh, this, quote, may be a valid religious perspective, but it is not it is of no relevance to the investigation of crime for purposes of prosecution. OK, so another point about different ways of looking at the same phenomena. Okay. And then he writes, the law enforcement investigator must objectively evaluate the legal significance of any criminal spiritual beliefs. In most cases, including those involving Satanists, it will have little or no legal significance. If a crime is committed as a part of a spiritual belief system, it should make no difference which belief system it is. Okay, so that, that was a big uh, taste of what I categorize as contextualizing because you, you see how he's dividing things up and making us understand that people look at this phenomena with different purposes and in different contexts and the one he's coming to it from, which is the legal perspective. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's he, – he's like parsing through it and, and – and, Pre, I mean, pretextualizing pre the generality of satanic crime and, and minimizing some of these cases like Richard Ramirez or, you know, I, I mean, Richard, in his, in Lanning's definition, Richard Ramirez is not a satanic criminal because he operated alone, you know, even though he might have been motivated by satanic values, right? Right. Be because... Because the, the point is this, Satanism is not illegal in the United States. So he can't go into court and say Ramirez is guilty because he was motivated by Satanism. Right. So in a sense, Satanism becomes irrelevant because he has to go into court saying Richard Ramirez, Ramirez uh, committed these crimes and right. these illegal crimes, here's the evidence against them. That's why. 
Right. Well, that actually, to me, is actually fair, right? So he's just, well, yeah. he's just talking it as a law enforcement guy. Exactly. And that's fair for any case. You can take motive out of a case, and it still doesn't mean somebody didn't do it. Even if you don't know the motive of why somebody shot somebody in high school, you don't, you know. You, they, right. I mean, if you have Ramirez uh, at a certain location when a certain crime was committed and you have all the evidence, you don't need to talk about why he did it. Right. Right. It's just he did it. There you go. That's that's the legit litigious aspect of it. Right. So then I want to talk about um, a little bit of the philosophy as I see it that Lanning brings into it. So okay. let me read this uh, bit of a lengthy quote, but it's worth it. The large number of people telling the same story is, in fact, the biggest reason to doubt these stories. It is simply too difficult for that many people to commit so many horrendous crimes as part of an organized conspiracy. Two or three people murder a couple of children in a few communities as a part of a satanic ritual and nobody finds out? Possible. Thousands of people do the same thing to tenth of tens of thousands of victims over many years? Not likely. Hundreds of communities all over the America are run by mayors, police departments, and community leaders who are practicing Satanists who regularly murder and eat people? Not likely. In addition, these community leaders and high-ranking officials also supposedly commit these complex crimes, leaving no evidence, and at the same time function as leaders and managers while heavily involved in using illegal drugs. So the point is when I think what he's talking about is that you kind of get this copycat effect of people telling these stories and then people start repeating them. And then whenever they're distrustful of some policeman or, or government personnel, they start crying satanic conspiracy. Gotcha. Uh, and that's just a point about, um, uh, you know, the, the philosophy he's bringing into it, how he'd use it. So he's, he's now, like couching it within the satanic panic position. Yeah. Right, right. And frankly, I mean, I think that's, I think that's very fair um, for him to point out that it seems unlikely that you have um, large segments of the government being run by Satanists and regularly committing all these crimes. Right. Agreed. Agreed. The point is we don't really know, but why don't we know? Or is it something that is just claimed and never actually evidenced? So what I thought about is, well, we know of drug cartels, right? We know of human trafficking. We know of weapons trafficking. And these include, quote unquote, horrendous crimes as part of an organized conspiracy. Right occurring within hundreds of communities all over the world, right? I mean, no so that's part of the problem with the philosophy he brought into it, is that we do know that these sort of things do actually happen within the realm of drugs, human trafficking, or weapons trafficking. But somehow we're supposed to say, well, that's about it, folks. Um, <laughs> those are major conspiracies, and we know about them. But supposedly... Um, there's no spiritual element to it. So let me mention that I was watching a show on occult crimes, and there came this veiled figure whose voice I recognized. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you tell us about that major, major conspiracy that was going on just south of the border? Right. So Madame Morris, I mean, it's Adolfo Constanzo, who was, his mother was probably a witch. She was actually from Cuba, was in Mexico, Mexico City, he was a tarot card reader. He believed in all kinds of uh, cold ideas and decided to start a drug running operation in Matamoros, south of the Texas border. And to aid his group and to intimidate people, he literally started sacrificing people and came to an end after he sacrificed a young gringo named Kilroy. Uh, he, he instructed his followers to go to the border town and abduct this young guy, Gringo, and they murdered. I mean, they did unspeakable things. But the interesting thing about Costanzo is he was on a murder rampage. Literally, there were murders that were happening in Mexico City where there were body parts found and there was an entire rival drug gang that was wiped out and thought to be 
you know, late at him and his group, he had this one woman named Maria Aldretti who was from actually Texas. Um, she was very tall, but they, she exhibited all kinds of strange behaviors. She had a ritual thing in her room. They thought maybe she was sacrificing, yeah. you know, creature and, and pe people. If you, yeah. if you recall, one of the key aspects that blew that whole conspiracy uh, apart is that when they got some local guy to start digging up the dead body of the gringo, <laughs> right. um, he said to the law enforcement, he said, oh, I don't know what the big deal is about this one guy. There's dozens of bodies buried all over here. Right. Yeah. And indeed, that's what they ended up fighting, that, finding, that it was a mass occult conspiracy and there were dead bodies dozens all over that area yeah they were killing rivals they were killing people of their own group it was and, and, a slaughterhouse and, and so there's an example of horrendous crimes as part of an organized conspiracy right? right there it is i mean we know that that happened right true sacrifice yeah i mean yeah. he had something called the naganga which was like a cauldron where right they put the blood in and supposedly raised spirits you know really dark and crud. i mean the guy Adolfo yeah. Costanzo was very knowledgeable and uh, really a warlock. I mean, we, in Mexico, they call him a brujo, I think was be the term. But yeah, amazing. Right. So there, there, there's examples. These things do happen. And I did list, you know, I wrote a thing about John Douglas for my book, <laughs> Abomination, and I did list all of these cases that the guy who did the occult crimes for Netflix, he referenced some of those in the, in the show. And that's why he, you know, wanted me to interview. So I right. talked about the vampire clan. The Hardy Boys, Adolfo Constanzo, the Beast of Satan, Beast of Satan. So these things do happen. Um, so now, this is another aspect of it, which is, okay, what if a crime is not reported as being satanic, but as being occult, or as being brujeria, or as being uh, santaria, or as being uh, voodoo, or as being, I mean, you Paolo name it. Mayumbe, you, yeah, Paolo yeah you could use tons of different terms and you would miss out on it. So I thought since the report is specifically about Satanism, let's talk about that a little bit. Okay. So Lanning writes, many admitted Satanists claim that they do not even believe in God, the devil, or any supreme deity. Okay. And that is very, very common. It's a very common PR talking point by Satanists. And incidentally, anytime I read an article where a Satanist is being interviewed, it's not an interview as much as a platform, a PR platform, where the Satanist is given reign to say whatever they want in a completely unchallenged matter with no fact checking whatsoever. So let me point out, um, yeah, perhaps there are Satanists who don't believe in God, the devil, or any supreme deity whatsoever, sure. But uh, if they tell us that, we would have to ask, well, do they have some sort of absolute ethic against lying to begin with? I mean, why should we believe them? But that's fine. Let, let's say we believe them. Uh, let me give you an example of Anton LaVey, because LaVey and Satanists will most certainly tell you that they don't believe in God, the devil, or anything like that, right? Right. But you may recall that Anton LaVey's girlfriend's Jane's Jane Mansfield, her son was mauled by a lion, okay? Right. And what Anton LaVey did is he gathered together his fellow Satanists, and they petitioned, quote-unquote, our brother Satan for healing. Okay, so they're appealing to Satan. They're petitioning to Satan as a personal being for the healing of this boy. All right, so they can claim whatever they want, but when we see what they actually do— <laughs> Right. It tells a very different story, right? So Lanning spent some time, uh, rightly, by the way, noting that just because someone is into religion X does not necessarily mean that X motivated them to commit the crime or that they appeal to X in order to do so. So that, that I think that's very fair. But uh, if I could, I wanted you to read a certain statement that we discussed uh, from okay. Aleister Crowley. Okay. Magic in Theory and Practice. Yes. Chapter 12 of The Bloody Sacrifice and Matters Cognate. Reading, in any case, it was the theory of the ancient magicians that any living being is a storehouse of energy varying in quantity according to the size and health of the animal and in quality according to its mental and moral character. 
At the death of the animal, this energy is liberated sunny, suddenly. The animal should therefore be killed within the circle or the triangle, as the case may be, so that its energy cannot escape. An animal should be selected whose nature accords with that of the ceremony. Ceremony. Thus, by sacrificing a female lamb, one would not obtain any appreciated quality, quantity of the fierce energy useful to the magician who was invoking Mars. In such a case, a ram would be more suitable, and this ram should be a virgin. The whole potential of its total and original energy should not have been diminished in any way. For the highest spiritual working, one must accordingly choose that victim which contains the greatest and purest force. A male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence is the most satisf satisfactory and suitable victim. Okay, so there you have it. Per perhaps somebody is into Satanism and or is into Crowley and they commit a crime and it had nothing to do with Satanism and Crowley. But perhaps it did because there's, base, there's uh, some very specific instructions right there as to how to go about performing a ritual crime, right? Right. And here it goes on. But the bloody sacrifice, though more dangerous, is more efficacious. And for nearly all purposes, human sacrifice is the best. Right. And I'm going to springboard right off of that by reading a few statements from Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible, because he has a whole chapter titled On the Choice of Human Sacrifice. Okay. okay. The use of a human sacrifice in a satanic ritual does not imply that the sacrifice is slaughtered, quote unquote, to appease the gods. Symbolically, the victim is destroyed through the working of a hex or curse, which in turn leads to the physical, mental or emotional destruction of the, quote unquote, sacrifice in ways and means not attributed to the magician. All right, you got that so far? So yes, yes. Um, it's interesting because he's speaking that uh, symbolically the victim is destroyed, uh, but then he makes it clear that it's actually very literal, which because it could lead to the physical destruction, right? Okay. Okay. He also states the only time a Satanist would perform a human sacrifice would be if it were to serve a twofold purpose, that being to release the magician's wrath in the throes of a curse, or more important, to dispose of a totally obnoxious and deserving individual, which is a very subjective criteria, yeah, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> he also writes, the question arises, who then would be considered a fit and proper human sacrifice, and how is one qualified to pass judgment on such a person? The answer is brutally simple. Anyone who has unjustly wronged you, one who has gone out of his way to hurt you, to deliberately cause trouble and hardship for you or those dear to you. In short, a person asking to be cursed by their very actions. All right. So, again, very uh, subjective because um, this is about one who qualifies according to your own view, right, that you've been wronged. He also writes, when a person, by his reprehensible behavior, practically cries out to be destroyed, it is truly your moral obligation to indulge them their wish. The person who takes every opportunity to pick on others is often mistakenly called sadistic. In reality, this person is a misdirected masochist who is working towards his own destruction. The reason a person viciously strikes out against you is because they are afraid of you or what you represent or are resentful of your happiness. They are weak, insecure, or on extremely shaky ground when you throw your curse and they make ideal human sacrifices. Okay, he also states... Mad dogs are destroyed, and they need help far more than the human who conveniently made froths at the mouth uh, when irrational behavior is in order. These people, given the opportunity, they would destroy you. Therefore, you have every right to, parentheses, symbolically destroy them. And if your curse provokes their actual annihilation, Rejoice that you have been instrumental in ridding the world of a pest. 
if your success or happiness disturbs the person, you owe him nothing. He is made to be trampled underfoot. Okay, so it is interesting that he has this interplay of symbolism and actual, right? You have every right to symbolically destroy them uh, and or but you can cause their actual annihilation. Gotcha. So now if you're a Levian sat Satanist and you commit a satanic crime, you can most certainly point your finger right to that chapter and say, look, I have valid justification and I did it for these reasons. Right. I mean, so the, what you were pointing out is both Crowley and LaVey had said semen sacrifice as, you know, a viable option for their doctors, right? But in, in, right. I mean, I think that Crowley, if you look through the book of the law, it's also be at them. You know, I poke out the eyes of Muhammad, Jesus on the cross. Jesus, all that yeah. stuff. So, so you see this nastiness and also, you know, uh, the joy of the world is to crush your enemies. So you kind of see that nastiness flow through both of them. So they could potentially kill somebody in both the act of vengeance and sacrifice. Right. And now uh, on this specific point, Lanning writes, some people would argue that Christians who committed crimes misunderstood and distorted their religion while Satanists who commit crimes are following theirs. But who decides what constitute a misinterpretation of a religious belief system? The individuals who committed the above described crimes, however, misguided, believe that they were following their religion as they understood it. Exactly. I mean, I just, what we just read from Crowley and LeBay were extremely explicit that there's no a gray area. Oh, who decides what constitutes as a misinterpretation? You okay. really don't have to interpret anything. It's right, right there in black and white. Very plain. Exactly. <laughs> Now, I wanted to point out at least one relation to Satanism um, in this topic is an organization that has promulgated the concept of pseudo-memories, which is the False Memory Foundation. Is there anything you could tell us about that? The False Memory, I believe that came up in the McMartin trial, right? Didn't the False Memory Foundation pop up and one of this guy's name that a lot of these memories were fake? But it also right. turned out he was either involved in the occult or he was a pedophile or something like that. I can't remember exactly. Do you know? Okay. Do you recall that? No, I, I just thought to to ask in, in in case you had an insight. But there was something specific I was going to point out about this. Okay, <laughs> this yeah, is if you go to the False Memory Foundation's website, okay, and you search for the name Doug Messner you'll find him being referenced therein, okay? Doug Messner, M-E-S-N-E-R. Uh, they, they have quite a few articles written by him posted on the False Memory Foundation's website. Well, Doug Messner, under his AKA Lucian Graves, is oh, the no. co-founder <laughs> is the co-founder of the Satanic Temple. Right. So he's like in Oklahoma or somewhere in the Midwest, right? Um, well, I, you know what? The, the Satanic Temple really um, started as one of these, a handful of people in their mother's basement. And uh, because they're social political activists, they get a lot of media attention. And now they actually have uh, chapters all over the place. Gotcha. Uh, I could have I, I swore they were involved in the installation of a statue in like oh yeah. Of, yeah 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 the statue of baphomet with That's two it. children adoringly uh looking at it yeah now of course so so there you have uh relation of course some kind of to whatever level some kind of relation between the founder of the satanic temple and the false memory foundation however tentative that relation may be it's there and of course i was not surprised at all that this satanic temple um, are activists in favor of abortion okay and you, I, you know, i'm telling myself oh boy so satanists who petition on behalf of uh human child sacrifice wow that's shocking <laughs> not surprise there no surprise 
Yeah. Uh, other statements by Lanning. Some psychotic people are preoccupied with religious delusion and hear the voice of God or Satan telling them to do things of a religious nature. Fair enough, right? Um, certainly happens. He also refers to that ritual can also stem from psychotic hallucinations and delusions such as compulsive ritualism, basically OCD. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. So, so you can see that he's trying to get you to understand that just because something looks like ritual. a religious ritual, it may not be, and there could be other factors and that's fair enough. Right. That's fair. But you know what he leaves out, what he omits is he should put in some of Crowley's rituals. However, mm -hmm. Here's the right. exact rituals Crowley did for killing animals and you know releasing energy and summoning spirits. Yeah, he, you're right about that. You, you have this basically missing piece of the puzzle, which is well, what what do text on occultism and Satanism encourage their followers to actually do? Right, that would be uh, important when your point of view is deriving evidence you can use it in court. Right. Okay, so he also states, the leaders of groups may want to play upon the beliefs and superstitions of those around them and try to convince accomplices and enemies that they, the leaders, have special or supernatural powers. He also writes, some clever offenders may deliberately introduce elements of Satanism and the occult into sexual exploitation simply to confuse or intimidate the victims. Right. So, th so those are, I thought those were very important points and very valid. Um, but again, he doesn't get around to saying something like some clever offenders uh, introduce elements of Satanism into, and the occult because they actually believe it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, I mean, I, I include in my book, uh, Children of the Beast, there were two cults. There's one in Britain and another one in Central California that used the Book of the Law and Crowley stuff as a backdrop for all of their crimes. I think the one in Britain involved massive you know, sexual abuse, pedophilia, and the one in California, they were murdering people, you know? So, and the, the guy is in jail here still, like his name was Gerald Cruz, and he was the head, and he had a Scarlet Women, and he had all these people doing stuff, and literally they had a compound with 40 people or something like that, and they, they finally got caught for killing somebody who wanted to leave the group, but, uh, you know, these people were, were I mean, yeah, I can, you can go through my book, Children of the Beast, and you can see what he's referencing and all the statements are all right out of Crowley's handbook, you know? So there, there, the one you just discussed, there you go. There's a major conspiracy involving at least 40 people. Right. <laughs> and it was real life happening. I mean, it's, it just happens that it got busted and that's why we know about it. Correct. I mean, there's probably some that don't get busted, right? Oh, yeah, right. And, and I mean, that in a sense is an argument from silence, right? Technically, we can't really say, well, they must be out there. And the reason we know they're out there is because we don't know that they're out there. Right. right? That That's an argument from silence. But the fact is, like I said, that case you just mentioned, the Matamoros case, the uh, human trafficking, the weapons trafficking, the drug trafficking, I mean, these are all massive cons conspiracies. Right. Um, so another statement from Lanning, the facts are some individuals believe in and are involved in something commonly called Satanism and the occult. Some of these individuals commit crimes. Some groups of individuals share these beliefs and involvement in, this, in Satanism and the occult. Some members of these groups commit crimes together. The unanswered questions are, what is the connection between the belief system and the crimes committed. Is there an organized conspiracy of satanic and occult believers responsible for interrelated serious crimes, uh, such as molestation and murder? And he states that blaming Satanism for a teenager's vandalism, theft, suicide, or even act of murder is like blaming a criminal's offense on his tattoos. Both are often signs of the same rebelliousness and lack of self-esteem that contribute to the commission of crimes. Okay, and I would say that, however, 
for example, uh, the example of LeVay's Satanic Bible, right? It claims that ritual murders in the name of Satan are perfectly acceptable. So then blaming Satanism for a teenager's crimes uh, when they are truly motivated by such Satanism is actually perfectly valid, right? Agreed. Agreed. I mean, you, you can't just paint with a broom. Just because he makes a good point about it doesn't mean you can paint with a broom and say, well, then, therefore, um, nobody is motivated by it. But again, back to the context, what, what I constantly hear him saying is, I can't take this into court. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But I he, can't say uh, a, uh, Satanism, therefore, he's guilty. Uh, well, look at the actual crime. What was the actual nature of the crime? What was done? And how do we know what's the evidence? That's what we're really attempting to get down to. Uh, so let me make a last statement here that um, along these lines, okay, consider that most atheists are evolutionists, so they believe that humans are merely temporarily and accidentally existing hairless apes, right? right. This actually led to atheists becoming the worst mass murderers in history during a mere few years in the early 1900s. And it may be that similar reason to that, that atheist countries lead the world in the production of child pornography, something which requires a massive conspiracy to produce and distribute, by the way. So there, there's another example of how a worldview, a belief system, even if it's atheism and or evolution, can most certainly lead to the commission of crimes. Serious crimes, right? Yeah, I mean, it's maybe not. It may not be spiritual or religious at all, but still, the belief the belief that a large segment of your population are what the communist atheists called worthless or useless eaters leads to mass murder. I mean, just genocide, slaughter. That that is just a simple fact. Right, no doubt. I mean, you can. And atheism is a religion. I mean, even Darwinism is a religion based upon. Uh, an incredible myth you know there was some boiling water <laughs> 200 million years ago and then dna magically created and entered into a cell and but the the uh, issue <laughs> is that the communists were very open about why they were doing what they were doing and they were doing what they were doing based on their worldview philosophy that's the point right because the, the unique feature of the communist mass murders was that those people were not dying in wars fighting other countries and other armies. They were actually being mass murdered by their own countries right. uh, because they were seen through this worldview that see, saw them as nothing but lesser evolved bioorganisms. And so we're back to the point about how most certainly a person's worldview, their philosophy, um, their religion, whatever you want to call it, uh, it can most certainly be a motivating factor, but can you then take that into the courtroom <laughs> and argue it, right? I mean, can you argue, hey, this guy was motivated by Satanism? Well, that is not the litigious way to go about it, is it? I would say that the crime, you know, the thing step for themselves, the crime itself is probably, you know, the you would go through the standard criminal procedures in a court to ascertain whether somebody committed, you know, had the mens rea or whatever to commit the crime. And that would be the standard in all court cases. Now, getting the motivation would be something that the trier of fact would want to know why he did it. You know, what was the motive? Was it money? Right. Sex? So that would that would give them a better understanding of why this crime happened. Unusual crime. So whether it's a satanic crime or not is only uh, just for the better understanding of what's going on in a court. But you can take the Satanism out of every, any case, you know, whether it's the West Memphis theory or probably any of those occult motivated crimes. Did Richard Ramirez, was he at the crime scene? Did he admit to it? Was his DNA there? You know? <coughs> so I think, I think that that's an important issue. I, I think that the Lanning report kind of fails by his generality in his general approach without stating specific instances where Satanists actually engaged in, in ritualized or ritualistic murder. 
because those are those are objective facts that he could have put into the report. However, in these oddball cases, you know, Richard Ramirez was using pentagrams of made in blood on the wall, you know. Right. So that is definitely a huge failure of the report. And the way that people handle the report, there's a major failure there in failing to notice what I stated up front and what I've been trying to push home this whole time, which is what is the context of the report? Right. And the context is the legal aspects of how you would handle uh, a case. I mean, that that's really what the – it is not just simply an FBI agent um, telling us whether any such thing actually ever happens. It's more about an FBI agent helping law enforcement handle these sort of claims and whether that's something that they need to focus on or bring up or how exactly – are they going to handle it? And this is why in the West Memphis three case, you hear a reference to Lanning because it's like, okay, how is Lanning helping us with this case? Right? Right. right. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about worldviews or philosophies or anything else. They're talking about how are we going to handle this case? Right. And I mean, the other thing that's interesting about the Lanning report is the way it's referenced. It's usually not referenced was what it is and its title indicates is that it's about ritual child abuse. It's not even so much about that murder. So people use that, I mean, use those particularly in the West Memphis three case talking about murder, but it's actually the, the, the full from beginning to end, you know, narrative of the landing report is about child victims, you know? So I think that one of the problems is that people just use this landing report and expect nobody to really read it and get the gist of what Lanning wrote about, you know? Yeah, and that was the point I made up front about how easy it is to throw out a one-liner about the Lanning report. Yeah. But even as you just pointed out, yeah, it is focused upon satanic ritual abuse. It's not just about any and all satanic crime ever. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so I think that that's one of the interesting contexts. Well, is there anything you would like to finalize and summary about your investigation and analysis of the landing report? I think these last few statements we made are what the, the main thing I wanted to state is to understand his perspective, uh, his context, and take it for what he is telling us and not just what you can make of it for PR purposes. Right. And I mean, I think that that's it. You know, the people are using it. Right. And that's a great point. You know, they are using it for PR purposes without, you know, I think referencing it specifically. You're like you said, I think you perfectly stated it. One liner one liner references which don't really get into the the details of the landing report. Right. And I mean one liner versus uh spending an hour <laughs> just <laughs> Just to elucidate what on earth is actually being stated, uh, what is missing from it, how to understanding, adding some evidence from Crowley and LeVay and all these different things. I mean, so um, who's going to sit down and listen to an hour's worth of discussion between us two if their point of view is the one-liner point of view? Right. That's a good point. That's a good point. And I think that that's, that's important. What you brought into our discussion is – these specific statements by Crowley and LeVay, like, come on, you know, if you're really going to talk about occult crimes, there's, there's doctrines in there, just like you referenced communism, you know, we got to get rid of the, the proletariat, right. Or the bourgeoisie, right. The bourgeois, so, yeah. yeah, Got to get rid of the bourgeois stuff. And the Satanists are saying, got to kill them for energy and you can need vengeance. Right. In fact, uh, as we close up, um, do you remember the Miranda Barber um, murders? Tell me Miranda, about it. Miranda B A R B O U R. Vaguely, what to remind me? I don't remember that. Yeah, the the most significant thing I want to mention, and I know we're running out of time, so just in passing, is she was <laughs> okay. One statement she made about how many people she had murdered is that she only counted up to 22, and after that, she just stopped counting, okay? Right. And I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, because she claimed to be a Satanist to start with. 
then when she's asked, she says, oh, I murdered 22 and after I stopped counting. And I thought, okay, well, why not 21? Why not 23? Why not 10? Why, why is she saying 22? And then I remembered that Anton LaVey, <laughs> let's see. Um, this is a report uh, that was an article that was written about LaVey. Anton LaVey maintains that he isn't really concerned about accusations of people killing other people in the name of Satan. He swears that each time he reads a new killing spree, his only reaction is, what, 22 people? Is that all? All right? Wow. And, and I mean, that was, that was many, many years before the Miranda Barber murders. Did they ever so when prove, she, yeah, did they prove she killed anybody? Well, let me just close the, the loop by saying she claimed to be a Satanist, and she mentioned the 22. And just because I know LaVey, I knew that she knew what she was talking about. Interesting. Right? Interesting. Whereas who on earth in the media would say, oh, wait, 22, that definitely ties her back to, to LaVey, to Satanism. And she claims to be a Satanist. Therefore, she's at least in part motivated by her beliefs in, in Satanism. Fascinating. Right? I mean, it, it, and that's part of the problem. If you don't know these little details, um, <laughs> you, you, you very, can't see the references, right? Right. In fact, here's an interesting bit. In a 1986 article regarding accused Night Stalker killer Richard Ramirez convicted of murder, of, of convicted of 13 mur murders in California, LeVay said, when I, met, when I met Richard Ramirez, he was the nicest, most polite young man you'd ever want to meet. A model of deportment. He seemed like such a polite kid. Interesting. So there's another, uh, however loose, some sort of personal relation or tie, or at least a meeting and passing between LeVay and Ramirez. Right that's amazing. Yeah. So she did. Miranda Barber was convicted of killing Troy La Ferrara. So there's one that she went to jail for, though claiming that she killed at least 22 people. So right. Life sentence. But I'm telling you that that number 22 links her directly to the fact that she knows she knows what she's talking about when she's calling herself a Satanist. Yeah, she she told some very detailed uh, statements about her background, which you know, pretty harrowing, harrowing stuff. So you know, maybe it's true. I don't know. So any any last words, Ken, before we wrap this up? Nope. All Only right. that uh, I appreciate uh, discussing this with you again. It is a complicated and difficult and troublesome issue, and I'm glad to be able to speak about it with a person who would understand the subtleties revolving around it. Well, I appreciate so that. Just yourself. I, yeah. Thanks, man. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with myself and the audience. So hopefully we will do it again soon.